good job at fostering, but the white community has not. And there's a real shortage of white homes in this community. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, well, they get in the system and they adopt a couple of kids and they take themselves out. And I said, well, that's not going to happen to us. Well, I shouldn't have said that because we ended up adopting two special needs children. They're both autistic spectral disorders. So I have a special affinity for any kind of programs that help with, you know, the, these disorders. So uh, it's taught me a whole, whole nother lesson that I had never kn known in life. Uh, we have two daughters who breeze through school. Uh, when actually, when they went off to college, thanks to the Hope Scholarship, our expenses went down. But uh, I don't think our boys will, were our college material, and we're trying to find their way in the world, and hopefully there's programs out there, and that's what we're going to discuss today that can help with that. But right now, I'd like to introduce the folks who are going to do, do the panel. Uh, first here is Adam Von Bremer, who's with the Savannah Morning News in Savannah Now, right? And he's going to be the moderator. Uh, next, we have Jeffrey Shapiro, all the way from Los Angeles, California, who's come in to talk to us about, uh, he's the Executive Director of Exceptional Minds. Uh, then we have Nolan Kennedy. He's a UX designer for IBM. And finally, we have Lisa Junkin Lopez, Executive Director at the Juliet Gordon Lowe Birthplace in the Girl Scouts of America. So I'm going to turn it over to Adam and let him start with the session. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Again, this session is Can I Enjoy This? Designing for Accessibility. I'm very pleased to be joined up here by three very talented professionals, and we're going to try to spend the next 35, 40 minutes walking you through some of the questions we have, and then at the end, we'll let you guys chip in and ask what you need to ask. So before we talk about designing for accessibility, we have to define accessibility. You know, the context is really important, and it, and it varies. Is it, making, is it making an experience and an interaction accessible to those with physical or mental challenges? Is it making an experience and interaction accessible from the standpoint of making it uber engaging to encourage full participation? Or is it accessibility from the angle of making something super user friendly? And as you prepared for this panel discussion, how did you think about accessibility? So that's my setup. And uh, I'm going to start at that end because I know you have a video that you want to share. So let's go ahead and start down there with Lisa. All right. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, when I think about accessibility um, specifically, I think about you know, what, is the, what is the baseline for participation? Um, and, I, and I think there are, are numerous, you know, countless ways of thinking about accessibility because uh, individuals' needs, of course, are different. And so when we're looking specifically at accessibility um, for folks with disabilities, I think there are um, perhaps a certain set of um, um, features or um, needs that we need to look at, but I would, um, I think maybe the term that needs to be unpacked a little bit is disability, right? Because um, when we're designing for the greatest amount of accessibility, I think it's, I, I, I imagine my pan my fellow panelists might agree that very quickly, um, although there are specific needs that folks with disabilities have, that you quickly realize that all of us, you know, there are a range of abilities that we all have, and um, maybe we need to broaden in our definitions of disability. And the other thing I would add is that, you know, I think just using the term accessibility maybe doesn't get to some of what you're talking about as you're kind of putting out these different possible definitions. Um, I, I think inclusion is the other piece that has to be added to the conversation. I think for me, that's about the full experience, the, um, the deepest levels of participation. And maybe there's language that goes beyond inclusion as well, right? Because sometimes inclusion feels like, okay, you're, you're in the room, you know, <laughs> you're, there's a space for you. But I think the question is like, was something designed with you in mind, right? And that's a different level. Nolan doing user interface design, how would you define? So I would consider accessibility to be like establishing a level playing field across the across the board for everybody. And like you said, I think that there is a good bit of unpacking that we need to do around disability. Uh, you know, typically when I hear the word disability, I immediately think of uh, some physical or neuro neurological issue. But there's several types of disability, whether it's physical or neurological, but as well as social, economic, and cultural disabilities. And understanding the context around those different forms of disability and designing and working with them across the playing field 
hopefully we can establish a world in which you know we're all equal and happy together. And I think that that's what accessibility really means to me is establishing just this aligned world where everybody can interact with whatever it is that they need to do and all the devices equally. And yeah. Good afternoon. So I agree with both Nolan and Lisa. The organization I lead, Exceptional Minds, is coming from it. Uh, we're addressing the issue from the perspective of inclusion and diversity. Exceptional Minds is a professional training academy and studio for individuals with autism. We, we train uh, those on the spectrum to become visual effects artists and animators. And it was started by a group of parents of children with autism because adults with autism are the most unemployed and underemployed group in this country. So to give you a little bit of a feel for what we do and the success we've had, we have this video. Thank you. It's nominated tonight for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture. It's the first superhero movie ever to receive a nomination in that category. The world of Wakanda was created through stunning visual effects some of them by the exceptional minds at one studio. Jill Fryer has our Sunday Closer. To create an Oscar-nominated movie like Black Panther, it takes thousands of creative minds, one of which belongs to visual effects artist Tony Saturna. This is before the operation, and this is after. He was tasked with getting rid of all the production stuff you're not supposed to see in this scene. I needed to remove these flags here and here and here. Tony works at Exceptional Minds, a nonprofit studio for artists who are on the autism spectrum. It feels very rewarding, to say the least. It was founded in 2011 by parents of children with autism. Susan Zwerman is the studio's executive producer. I always wanted to help others to aspire to become something, to be better in their lives. Exceptional Minds started as a three-year school teaching graphic and visual effects, and more recently, animation. I actually was the one that provided the voice for that. Generally speaking, areas where you can focus, where you can work on detail, those are things that are conducive for a lot of individuals who are on the spectrum. In 2014, they added a studio, giving graduates a place to work. Before long, they were teaming up with box office powerhouses like Marvel Studios. The idea was to do slow steps, give them more and more work as they succeeded, and they did over and over and over and over. Eli Katz worked on Black Panther, erasing straight hairs and cleaning up other imperfections. You must be very patient. <laughs> yeah, yes I am. We go hand in hand with their focus and determination get, makes our movies far better. Exceptional Minds has worked on 44 TV shows and 84 films, including Black Panther, Green Book, First Man, and Solo, A Star Wars Story, all Oscar nominees. I said, wow, we worked on that. When I shared it with the audience, I knew everybody was cheering. Perhaps the greatest reward is seeing their work on the big screen and their names in the credits. I couldn't help but um, put my um, fist up in the air. For Eli, the best reaction came from a friend. As soon as he saw my name, he started shouting in joy, telling, telling everyone in the seats that my name was on there. Were you a little embarrassed or were you proud? No, uh, uh, a little, little bit of both. What can society learn from this? Try and treat others, you know, um, with respect and let them live their full potential. Unlocking creativity that flourishes inside truly exceptional minds. For Sunday Today, Joe Fryer, Los Angeles. They do beautiful work, Joe, thank you very much. So in watching that and, and hearing from all of you, accessibility, it's almost like no matter who it is, as long as you give them a chance and put them in a position to succeed, that they will. So what is the connective tissue? What do you need to do to make everything accessible? Is it using technology? Is it, is it personality? Is it, what is it? I, I think it's all of the above. 
Um, I think it does start, though, with transforming expectations. Um, that's what we like to say we do, and I think that that's the key, whether it's inclusion in the workplace or whether it has to do with uh, technology or whether it has to do with uh, taking a historical monument and, and making it accessible for everybody to experience that, uh, that history. I think it starts with changing, uh, changing our perspective. And once you do that, then you get results like that. When you're designing a, a software or, or an interface, what do you have to start with? Yeah, I think that um, what you said has a, is pretty much exactly right. It, is, it does come from reframing uh, your mindset. And to dive a little bit deeper into that, I think it's a lot to do with empathy and putting yourself in another person's shoes and understanding how you would feel if you were that person. And I think that once we can really learn to apply this level of empathy, um, whether we're designing or working in social work or uh, even finance, once we're able to empathize with our user and empathize with uh, the people that we're working with and working for, we're, we'll really be able to start having these bigger impacts and be able to see the changes in the world that we need to see. I love where both of you are starting with those answers. So I'm just going to build on those, which is to say, yeah, I, I mean, transforming expectations is critical. And right, you pointed to the fact, just to share um, uh, the work that we're doing, the Juliet Gordon Lowe birthplace um, is um, the home of the founder of Girl Scouts. It's here in Savannah, Georgia. And I always like to ask, how many people were Girl Scouts growing up in this room? All right, all right. Um, well, I hope um, if you haven't have it, had a chance to visit, you've got to come see our site. Um, it's a, a really important national historic landmark, again, dedicated to the story of a woman who has empowered countless millions of other women. Um, and to your point, right, I think it's easy for us to make assumptions around um, accessibility that oh, that's just not going to work here, right? And I think like a prime place to imagine that it's just not going to work here is a national historic land. Uh, Landmark, where we do have um, obligations to maintain the historic fabric of the building, right? Um, but if we can begin to think creatively, think like designers, um, think like creative professionals that we are, then I think you realize there are many more opportunities. Um, and I love your point about empathy too. Um, you know, I, for us, you know, some of some of the folks here. Uh, I'm holding down the low tech, you know, arm of this panel for sure. And I and I'm going to kind of ground into that a little bit, especially in relation to the expertise of my colleagues, because, you know, it's about can you get through the door? It's about can you use the toilet, right? These are like fundamental daily experiences that we are either um, making available to people or we're cutting off. So if you lack that kind of empathy, or maybe it's just simple decency, right? Um, then um, you're really not going to get to where you need to be in terms of accessibility. But I think all of us have to somehow, on some level, reframe our thinking because we're so used to, we're so comfortable with um, a society that has erected these barriers that exclude, um, that we really do have to kind of retrain ourselves, rethink what's possible in order to um, create, build the society that ultimately I think we all want. Accessibility. When you've got the mindset now, you, you know where you need to, to be, where you need to start, where do you take it from there? What are some of the early steps to, to really build something new with accessibility in mind? For us, it, uh, there were two factors. First was research, because we were creating a program that combines both the technical skills that individuals need with the employability skills and, and building it into a pedagogy a teaching methodology that would work for the specific population we're working on. So we had to start with research because there wasn't, we couldn't Google it or, and find how, how to do this. But the second part and the most important part is we needed those partners. We needed the opportunity to prove ourselves. So you saw Marvel Studios stepped up big time and hired us. In addition to hiring us to do work in the studio, they've hired two of our alumni as has uh, Cartoon Network, has, as has Warner Brothers. Game of Thrones was the first TV show we worked on. So when you work for Marvel, Marvel and when you work for Game of Thrones, you, you definitely have uh, street cred in, in the industry, and it opened the door for other studios to give our alumni a chance, uh, both with our studio as well as with others. So it was research, 
and, and the partnerships to really take a risk and take that, that chance with us. I know, Nolan, you have certain policies or, or goals that, that you start with that you have to build toward in, in your work, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, with design, accessibility comes should come in, hopefully, at the very foundation of whatever you're starting to work on. A lot, I feel like a lot of people in the design industry, they finish up their product, finish up their design, and then they think, oh, accessibility. For them, it's just another check mark at the end of the day. But something that I am very proud of IBM for doing is our design system is built fundamentally from the ground up for accessibility, hitting the color contrast ratios that you have to hit, um, hitting text sizes, shapes, uh, shapes of the components. And with design, it's not just it's not just another tick box. It's something that we fundamentally have to do. And it's not just we should do it, we should be good people. It's the UN has declared accessibility in design and interfaces technology a basic human right. It's whether if you're not an empathetic person, hopefully you're somebody that obeys the law. And I think that, I really think that if we can start designing at a fundamental level, building from the ground up, I think that we could really see a beautiful world. Like imagine if Savannah 300 years ago had started with the mindset of we need to make this accessible. The city would be a lot different than it is now instead of having to come back and edit it in the future. Um, when I think about where do we start, um, for me, uh, uh, working for Girl Scouts, it's really all about starting with our values. Um, Girl Scouts has a really um, deep and long commitment to inclusion, and I think that's part of um, absolutely what drives the work at the birthplace to really prioritize um, uh, this initiative that we're working on to make our site um, more accessible and inclusive, and then to extend that commitment um, by providing services to others. Um, uh, uh, we also, I'll say, um, uh, just to connect to some of the themes of this event, um, you know, our girl experience is rooted in the principles of go-getter, innovator, risk-taker, leader, G-I-R-L, right? So all of those things also drive us forward, and I think that's um, part of, again, that kind of creative impetus that we all bring to the work. Um, but again, for us, it really starts with... Um, it starts with understanding what the needs are um, for people with disabilities experiencing our site. And you can't do that without working directly with folks with disabilities. Um, and also, as you said, having really great partners. So um, what we are doing um, is um, partnering with this fabulous organization called the Institute for Human-Centered Design. They're based in Boston. They're a longstanding nonprofit that addresses universal design um, issues and advocates in that way. Um, they have helped us to identify um, uh, physical uh, uh, facilities needs in terms of um, either um, meeting that uh, that standard of ADA or more importantly kind of thinking beyond that standard which really is a kind of low bar to set for accessibility um, and then um, because we have to get our own house in order first right um, and then kind of think broader from that so um, they um, they helped us to um, create a user experience um, kind of lab at our site where we brought in um, all kinds of um, folks including Girl Scouts themselves with a whole range of different abilities and ask them to um, experience our programs, our tours, everything that we offer to the public and, and just make observations, provide feedback. All of that was really documented. And that is fundamental, right? You can't fix things if you're not talking to the folks who are going to be experiencing them in the first place. And I'll also just say where we're going with this, we um, hope to make all of our programs, our physical spaces through um, an upcoming renovation, um, more accessible and inclusive to others. And then um, in year two of our initiative, we our staff, who will also receive a lot of staff training, so that's the kind of next step for us, is training staff to better serve audiences with disabilities. And then we will then become the trainers for Girl Scout troop leaders across the state of Georgia, helping them to better serve their audiences with disabilities and of course those are girls themselves so that's the way that we're kind of scaffolding this right really starting at the base starting with kind of fundamental like can you get through the door kinds of accessibility needs and then hopefully building and building on that so that we become a resource for others so we really think of ourselves as both a learner and a leader in this process and that speaks to um, the kind of acknowledgement that we've got a long way to go
let's follow that up. It's obvious that the, the three of you, inclusion and accessibility is not an afterthought. You've been able to convince some others, whether it's, it's people on your board or people at IBM or people at Marvel Studios. What are some of the, the roadblocks you've met and how have you tackled them to, to win people over to this line of thinking? Let's start, Jeff. The biggest roadblocks still are misperceptions, misconceptions, and just fear. People don't, they're still, the majority of people still don't, even though they may understand autism as a word, they don't understand what it really means. And they have certain, they have certain views. And the way we've tackled it is that we very, very regularly get people into our classroom, into our studio, and they see it. And they all leave, they all leave with their expectations completely transformed. They're blown away by, by what, they, what they see. And similarly, we'll go out in the field. We'll take, we'll take our artists, that's, we call our graduates, our alumni who work in our studio, artists and our students and our apprentices. We'll take them on field trips. And we'll take them to studios. We'll take them to other places. They'll represent exceptional minds at fairs around uh, the Los Angeles area. And, and once again, when, when, we are, when we're bringing people to, the, to water to actually see what it's like, that's, that's how we tackle it. But there's a long, there's a long, long way uh, to go to, to accomplish that. I think to kind of um, echo that, the misconception, miscommunication around disabilities of any sort is one of the biggest problems that uh, you tackle when trying to lead people to design more accessibly. Um, so something that I always like to do whenever coming up with, uh, in situations where uh, you're trying to advocate for accessibility design is try to, to bring up back the point of uh, empathy, try to get whoever you're talking to to empathize with the user. Something that like I always like to think about is, uh, say I'm designing something, making something. I, I don't have like a close relationship with somebody with disabilities, so I always think of my grandmother. What, how would I feel if I designed this and my own grandmother couldn't use it? And that, if that level of empathy that you can build through exercises like that and trying to get others to empathize with the people that is uh, really the key in handling those misconceptions. Um, for us, again, it's about, uh, you know, I think the success we've seen has been in part about rooting our initiative in those Girl Scout values, right? Um, they, uh, to connect um, the goals that we have for accessibility and inclusion at our site to Girl Scouts' vision of inclusion, I mean, it, um, it meets the needs of the organization overall um, around making sure that all girls are welcome to be a part of this organization and are included in the fullest capacity. Um, I'll also say, you know, there are, but Girl Scouts is huge, right? It's a huge organization with so many initiatives nationwide. For example, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work that we're doing around STEM. And you might argue, um, well, isn't that an ideal place for the kind of nexus of um, accessibility um, work um, to kind of tie that to STEM initiatives and to make that the space where you work? Well, you know, um, because again, people have misconceptions, I think, about the historic site and what we're capable of and what this space can be and how it can operate. But, you know, this the Juliet Lowe birthplace is also the kind of symbolic home of the Girl Scout movement, as we call it. So in some way, we're better, right, to, to um, make this commitment and to make these improvements. Um, the other um, kind of piece that I've really held on to is that, um, that, that I think is one of the reasons why our work makes sense at the birthplace is that Juliette Lowe herself was a woman with a disability. She was hard of hearing throughout her life significantly and wrote about that, talked about how it affected her life. So to be able then to kind of draw upon that history, to draw out that history in our tours and programs, right, is makes perfect sense 
intense, right? And at the same time, it kind of pushes us to do work that a lot of people don't associate with a traditional historic house museum. I mean, for us to be a kind of training hub around um, inclusion for Girl Scout um, troop leaders and other audiences, right? That's kind of outside the box of what you think of these institutions as being. But when you really look at what are your foundational values, what is your organization's history, you know, there are these through lines that you may be able to identify that will really help to drive the work forward and drive the narrative to find that support. Mainstreaming the inclusion issue, I think, is really what we're getting at here and, you know, asking that honest question. And I want to open it up for questions for just a minute, but I'm going to credit this to Jeffrey, who I think he stole it from somebody else. But there was a, a quote from the next Netflix vice president that talked about diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. So that's a pretty good way to think about accessibility. And uh, with that, I'm going to open it up. So if anybody has a, any questions for the panel, please give us a signal and a microphone will come your way. Hi, this um, question is for Mr. Shapiro. I'm, my name is Lovett. Um, I have um, two of my well, both of my children are on the autism spectrum, but so this is something close to my heart. Um, the question I have is about your Exceptional Minds program. Um, is training the, 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 uh, the adults on the autism spectrum how to uh, use their skills um, for the movie industry, but can those skills also be used in other fields, like for advertising or marketing? Absolutely, they can. We are, act we are now spending time trying to uh, build relationships with other industries where the skill sets of digital arts, because essentially what we do is digital arts, uh, can be applied. In addition, we just started down in the studio uh, a, a third or really a fourth area of work because it's visual effects, it's, it's uh, animation, it's end credits on, on films. You saw that uh, in, in the Today Show video. Uh, but gaming, we just started doing rigging for gaming uh, and we think that that's a huge growth area. Mm -hmm. And as a result, now we are developing um, a curriculum to introduce gaming and 3D animation into our uh, academy. And in fact, I, I spent uh, much of yesterday at SCAD and we're looking at maybe working uh, with SCAD on a number of things, but uh, one very well may be their input and, and thoughts and advice on developing our gaming curriculum because theirs is so strong. Um. Um, so this is a question for the whole panel. Um, most of large organizations or large corporations tend to take accessibility as like something you think about later, something that you only actually do once people start complaining about it. Um, what do you guys advise for people to do or just like once most of us as we start entering the career field, how do we try to kind of push those large corporations to be like, no, accessibility is something that, as you guys said, should be a basis, should be something that is overall thought of, not just something that is on the back burner. I mean, I think, uh, just to be practical about it, I think you have to develop the business case for why it makes sense to be more inclusive. And I think for those of us who do this work because we like believe in our souls that it's the right thing to do, <laughs> it can feel sort of like hard to make that business case or like that's not the argument we wanna be making because we wanna say like, why wouldn't you? But I think there is also a case to be made. And I think inclusion is all about like, you know, for us at Girl Scouts, you know, if we really say that we want to serve all girls, but folks can't get in the door, right, or our troop leaders don't know how to accommodate seeing eye dogs, for example, um, or how to work with folks um, with autism and who may have different needs in terms of understanding, you know, what troop activities are going to look like, then they're not going to be successful in doing what they see as their core mission, right? So I think we have to t be able, be well-versed, right, in language 
language that allows us to say how prioritizing accessibility and inclusion is better for everybody. And I really believe that. I really believe that inclusion isn't just good for um, folks with disabilities. It's good for everybody. Um, it makes for, like, uh, if there is strength and diversity, like, if we actually believe that, right, then <laughs> then this is, this is um, the way to go, and it will strengthen our businesses, our communities, our society in so many different ways. So I think you have to build the, the, those muscles to find that language. I also think the more that you can become the expert, the go-to, the more that you can build it into your daily work, and as you are successful, right, people will begin to see that that approach is valuable, and they will, it will begin to be kind of normalized in the organization that you're a part of. And I, well, I want to interject here. I, I think of two local groups just off the top of my head, Goodwill Industries and Low Country Down System, uh, Low Country Down Syndrome, who do a lot of work with, with people that are challenged and they, they train them and they involve them and, and they are doing productive work all over this community. And as somebody who works for a news organization, I, I try to take every chance I can to, to tell those stories. And I think the more people in the community kind of embrace that and, and make that, recognize that and, and spread it through social media or to their friends and everything else, that it, it can kind of take hold at a little bit of a grassroots level as well. Um, if I, I, I just want to build on what Lisa said um, because, and I think it's really important that if you're going to make a case, which everybody should be able to, it's not that it's going to be a burden on the company. It's going to be an asset. You can look at Microsoft, for example. Microsoft has a dedicated program in recruiting individuals with autism because of the strength of the programming skills that they, they have found. Look at, look at our program. Look at Marvel Studios. I guarantee you Marvel Studios would not be employing our graduates if it was going to in any way lessen the quality or demand for their films. So I, there, there's proof of that and it's really easy it's really easy to find. And I think that um, following up on what both of you have said, um, you know, the business case is very important, but I think that if you're at one of these larger corporations and you're in a situation where maybe your business case just isn't being seen by the right people, it's not taking hold, uh, a friend of mine explained something similar to me as the idea of bringing a blanket to work. Once, you, once one person brings a blanket to work, more and more people are going to start bringing that blanket to work because it's cold in the office, it's a great idea. So if you can be the one that is sitting there bringing that blanket of accessibility into your work and showing it to others and sharing it, I think that that's like a good way, grassroots way to fundamentally start incorporating uh, accessibility into the company, even if the maybe upper leadership hasn't taking, taken that on. Hey, uh, one question for you guys. Um, a lot of talk up to now has been sort of philosophical. Should we do this, and, and what is it? I'd love to get specific example from you guys. Where where is uh, an example in how you train someone where things were not quite as accessible and you course corrected, or in a UI, or in a building? So, um, I th so first thing that comes to mind would be um, alt tags and websites. So you have an image or some sort of element and you have a descriptor on it. A lot of people just leave that descriptor blank. They don't think about it or don't really put much in there. But somebody using a screen reader going through this website, they come across the image. If there's no alt text, you don't even know the image is there. It just skips right over it. You're missing a lot of the experience. Uh, for example, like if you close your eyes and I say the word pancake, you just imagine some sad looking pancake, but if you close your eyes and I say the word, a stack of blueberry pancakes with uh, sugar being sprinkled on top, that's a lot more descriptive and helps the person with low vision understand more of uh, what's going on. But another example of that would be, uh, I had the opportunity to do a workshop with uh, some, uh, some students from the Texas School of the Blind and interact with the physical devices that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. It is just 
simply bizarre how behind these devices are. It's incredible how expensive they are, $3,000 for uh, some of these devices, and they're so low tech and gritty and confusing and hard to use. I think that if we can really start helping them help build devices for people with these disabilities, uh, so they're able to easier use the rest of the world that's being designed, uh, I think that that's a place that has been severely underserved and needs to be worked with more. Our whole program is based on course correction. It's not only that individuals with autism are the most unemployed group, they're the ones that have, the, have among the, the, the largest educational challenges. Those with autism who go to college have a high dropout rate. K through 12 education across the country uh, has lots of challenges when it comes to special education, including those with autism. So we built our entire program around a model of first, there's a presumption of competence. Then the program is based on pace of learning on what the individual learner needs as opposed to, okay, the course, you know, th this course begins on this first day of the semester or trimester or quarter and ends here, and you have to be done or you fail. So we've, at, and obviously the, the type of instruction we have is done in a way that is completely sensitive to the needs of individuals with autism, which vary, because just as everybody in this room is an individual, Everybody with autism is an individual. There's no uni universal thing that, that identifies the full characteristics of, of how that manifestation is. And there was one more thing that just, just fell out of my head. So I'll stop with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer, and you can, if it pops into your All brain, right. you can jump back in. Um, uh, yeah, for us, uh, I mean, I think for us it's about making ourselves aware of where the site, it's not even about course correct, I mean it will be about course correcting, but right now it's kind of about bringing our awareness to the areas where we're failing in terms of accessibility and inclusion, and that ranges from um, you know, fundamental accessibility of a 200-year-old building, <laughs> right, um, and landscape, um, well, a 50-year-old landscape, 60-year-old landscape. Um, it, it's about, um, in many cases, it's about spaces that we were told are ADA compliant, pulling out the tape measure and going, okay, no, they're not. In fact, we, we thought that we had like numerous ADA accessible bathrooms. Not a one of them actually is, right? So it's like, it's a real shift in our consciousness and it's also about, um, you know, our programs. Look, and some of these programs are, you know, award-winning programs developed in the last three years that have been really successful, that we, that we see as successful, right? Until we start looking at it from a different lens and then start to ask questions. And so for us, that course correction process is really about trying to identify a, an approach or a strategy for how to tackle these things on a large scale? You know, do you go for um, the low-hanging fruit? Do you go for the pieces that are going to have the biggest impact? Do you go for the pieces that you can afford? And then, you know, it's like there's so many ways to think about it. Um, we just received a, a report from our partner, the Institute for Human-Centered Design, um, uh, of both our facilities and our programs in areas of improvement. And, you know, that, that document is like 150 pages long. It's overwhelming for our team to look at. But you have to actually start by looking really honestly at where things are, I believe, if then you're going to be able to even take on that, that course correction. So that's, that's where we're at in the process. And I did remember the last piece, which actually is the most important. And, and that has to do with our curriculum is completely interwoven with the technical and the employability skills. Now, people often call those skills soft, soft skills. We don't call them soft skills because for our population, for our students, it is actually the most difficult thing to overcome. The independent problem solving, the proper social skills, all of those things that make it really difficult to secure and keep a job or stay in stay in college. And so that was something that we, that we do that is definitely unique. 
I have, uh, I have a, a, a junior, uh, my son is a junior in college, and he could certainly use those employability skills, um, but they're not, they're not offered as part of the curriculum at San Diego State University, or as far as I know, most uh, mainline universities. So, yeah. You mentioned ADA, and that was something that, that I meant to get to earlier, and I don't want to turn this into a political discussion, but I would be curious to get you guys' perspective on what kind of role government policy has played and what kind of role does it need to continue to play in terms of accessibility. Hmm. Well, <laughs> you know, I think that, so I think that it's established like a baseline, a uh, minimum viable product, but there's so much more that we as individuals should be pushing for in our own workplaces. Like there's just, I feel like, yeah, like it's, it's established a baseline, but it's bizarre to me that like uh, looking at the FAA design manual, like all the, like the, colors and text sizes and all that. This document's 300 some pages long and it uh, highlights all these specific things. That's something that I feel like we need more so with uh, architecture and uh, city planning. If we can start, you know, getting these very like fine detail things down and establish this framework to work within, I think that that would be a step in the right direction. You know, anybody else want to tackle that one? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the legislation is critical, right? I mean, it was a game changer for people with disabilities, oh, yeah. and it was it was hard won. You know, the, if you read about the history of um, um, the disability rights movement, I mean, it's astonishing um, the commitments that people made to um, to protest, right, to fight for those um, those rights but you know it's like um, um, it's like civil rights in that sense I mean the legislation is clearly not enough right I mean it's 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 partly about how do we enforce the legislation but it's beyond that too again it's about I think we're all interested in this kind of grander question which is how do we build the societies that we want to build part of that absolutely comes from legislation and has to be a tool that we utilize but um, there's so much more, right? There's so much more. Yeah, it can't be legislation alone. Legislation does not change hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. And this is truly not effective without changing hearts and minds. And also, legislation can, in and of itself, isn't going to, to solve the problem from a very real perspective. So I remember, this isn't the case anymore, but I think I was flying about uh, 10, maybe 15 years ago, and I was in the exit row, and I took out the card, and on the card it read, if you cannot read this, you cannot sit in the exit row. <laughs> so the law was being followed, <laughs> but I don't think anything else needs to be said. Yeah. <laughs> yes, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? There's tools available for us who design websites to check for different um, disabilities like color blindness and screen reading, but me using that isn't the same as getting the real perspective of a user. So how do we go about getting real perspectives without making people feel uncomfortable or you know, just kind of saying, I wanna help you use this site fully and will you help me do that as well? Focus groups, right? Yeah, uh, focus groups, you know, s trying to f reach out and find these people that would be willing to user test uh, your product with that lens. Um, for example, there's websites such as usertesting.com where you can uh, put in specific criteria that you're looking for in your um, testing, testing area. And then I had another point, but it kind of slipped my mind. I apologize. Give me one second. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is your question. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that I think that if you can go out and try and find those users and find people that um, that have these disabilities that you're trying to design around and work directly with them as like 
a sponsor user, somebody that you have in the office with you on a day-to-day -day basis, that would be uh, really impactful. And, you know, uh, you s mentioned that you didn't want to make them feel uncomfortable. That's completely reasonable. It's, you know, it can be a difficult subject to talk around. But I was actually talking with somebody the other day, and they didn't realize that their color blindness was technically a disability. So if... You know, in examples with like colorblindness, uh, I don't think that you're going to run the risk as much of uh, making people feel uncomfortable, which uh, it's, I think that it's amazing that you, you know, have that consideration and you have that empathy for the person that you're going to be working with. And even if like you can't get them in there with you constantly to be user testing, if you can just sit and have like a good conversation with them and build that empathy, I, I'm a fan of the idea that anybody that you interact with, you now have empathy for that person and you can now design a little bit better for that person. Jeffrey, I, I'd like to kind of follow up a little bit on that with you is quality control. I assume that you have people in your academy who come from Hollywood backgrounds, they know what to look for. Did you also bring in studio people that would say, yeah, you guys do this very well, but you don't do this very well? How do you? Yeah, that? it's an ongoing process. Quality control for anybody here who is in gaming or visual effects or animation is, is critical. So yes, um, in our studio, all of the artists are our graduates, are all on the autism spectrum, but our supervisors come out of the, the post-production and animation industries. My hope is, as our program matures and our graduates become more senior professionally, that eventually even our supervisors will be alumni of ours uh, uh, as, as well. But in the academy, our instructors, our educators, come from the entertainment industry, but also have to uh, also have to be trained or come from a background of working with autism. And, and that's a very unique three-legged combination that you need to have. So there needs to be that ongoing quality of control, um, both with the academy, with, with our instructors, to make sure that, that they're teaching effectively, that they're staying on top of industry trends. Because if we don't, we're not going to meet our mission of employability. And even da and downstairs, we need to make sure that there's that ongoing um, autism training as well. Can I just add real Please. quick, as someone who just went um, through the um, user expert training uh, or um, user expert process, um, as I said, we brought in folks to experience our programs. I too was really nervous about what does it mean to kind of put someone in that um, in that place? And certainly, um, you know, for example, if we have absolutely zero accommodations for someone who um, is fully blind, um, it would not maybe make you you don't want to put someone in an experience that's going to be fully frustrating, right? That would not be an empathetic thing to do. To yeah. your point, um, but I was impressed with how enthusiastic folks were, and I think part of it is about respecting the expertise that they bring and acknowledging that, and also paying for that. I mean, we paid a very small stipend for what, what essentially was an hour or two worth of work. I mean, I'm talking about less than $100 in some cases. Um, but even that small kind of gesture, that token, I, I think, again, speaks volumes to respecting um, the expertise that the person brings to the table. If, uh, yeah, to kind of go off of that, you know, I think that, of course, have, be considerate, be empathetic towards the person. But if I came to you today and was like, listen, I want to sit down and talk with you because I want to design for you. I think that people, if you tell them that, they're going to get excited and want to work with you because everybody, you know, they care about themselves and they care about people that have the same problems that they do. And, yeah. Go ahead. Um, as someone who's worked with a lot of people with disabilities and has worked with like the Georgia Advocacy Department of Disabilities and just a lot of organizations, I know it's really hard for people to usually find a way to educate themselves on well, what does, like how do I make something accessible? Because I know mostly here at SCAV we don't actually have a disability certificate. Like we don't have um, something where you could be like, oh, in disability studies or you can learn about accessibility. So how would you what would you advise as individuals or just as a SCAD community, how can we go out and educate ourselves about how to be better designers for accessibility? I would say, um, I, I know I keep saying this, but empathy. <laughs> you know, uh, really trying to 
put yourself into that um, into that person's shoes. And even if it comes like uh, at IBM, we have uh, sets of goggles that once you put them on, it gives you different visual impairments and working with it that way. And um, could you repeat the last half of your question? I'm sorry. How would you go out as an individual to learn about these disabilities? Because like, I don't know what it's like to have dyslexia, sorry. How would you go out as an individual to learn about this? Like, I don't have dyslexia, but my mom has dyslexia. And I have absolutely no idea what it's like to have that just because I'm next to her. Like, how do you go out and how do I educate myself if I don't know what it's like to not have a leg or not, like, stuff like that? Yeah. I think that um, having conversations with these people as much as possible and trying to put yourself in their shoes as much as possible, whether it's... Uh, whether it's, you know, example, like goggles or having com like long drawn out conversations with them or even just like sitting and doing research by yourself and looking into like what what causes dyslexia, what uh, how does it impact you, uh, how does it impact the person, what triggers it, what makes it a little bit better, what makes it a little bit worse. And, um, you know, I think that you'll never really fully be able to understand uh, their situation, but the more you try, the more um, you just try to learn through research and conversations with these people, uh, the better off you'll be in terms of design. Yeah, I think one way of building that, if you don't have those personal relationships, I would say there's there are some really amazing kind of blogs, websites, and other digital resources by from you know for people with disabilities that um, I've learned a lot from just by um, you know spending time on those pages, um, and um, uh, you know often it's not just about what does it feel like to experience this life on a daily basis, but it's about how do I advocate for myself? How do I build community? I'll just give one example, which is that there is this really interesting um, digital campaign around the last election that was called Crip the Vote. And Crip, in this case, is being reclaimed and used as a kind of empowered term for um, by and for folks with disabilities. And um, just kind of reading about that campaign, what it meant for it to be all digital, um, the way that they were seeking to influence politics. I mean, that's like an incredible education for me. Um, and the other thing I'll say is I think it's um, our job to try to build that, um, that empathy um, you know, in our own hearts as much as we can. And I also think it's okay to acknowledge that you know, privilege, um, you know, that we will never fully understand what it is to have that experience, that our privilege like, doesn't allow that in so many ways, right? And um, sometimes I think we can kind of falsely imagine that we can like fully understand what it's like to be somebody else. And I just, I think it's like a good goal. And at the same time, I also think it's like really useful to acknowledge that gap that you're never fully going to live in someone else's shoes. And like maybe just recognizing that will, um, remind us again and again to like put um, that to put that person's voice at the center of the conversation. And and I think the best way always is learn the stories of those who have that. So for example, with autism, uh, there's a young man named Tom, uh, Thomas Island who wrote a book about his experiences with autism. If you go to the Exceptional Minds website, on almost every page, we have a story. Um, they're about they're, they're really short that tells the story of different students of ours and different alumni of ours and I would and I'm sure that they're with whatever area of disability that you're trying to learn about that there are equivalents um, uh, as well and I think you could seek out some volunteer opportunities I know that Savannah has a center for blind and low vision and uh, there's stuff out there if you if you turn some rocks over so. yeah any other questions? Hello, um, this is for everyone. I have a question on being able to like scale this up. So I know there's a lot of like different design mm -hmm. solutions and specifically in these different areas, um, but looking into maybe something like cars that you guys don't handle with, what would be the best way to kind of scale it up and to have these conversations with people that manufacture cars to make this something more like abled for those people? Tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
You know, I would say just, uh, especially like in a position of a student like you are currently, you know, you have all these different courses where you can take, um, take on the opportunity to explore any area that you want to take. Uh, so using that time and maybe even in your personal time, you know, maybe exploring what it would look like to design a more accessible car. You know, I've seen some cool renders of like the back, it's like low to the ground, the back folds out and you can just, you know, roll your wheelchair in there and it works great and well, looks like it would work great. So, you know, taking the time to maybe explore this yourself and then, uh, you know, seeing if you can reach out to people at these companies and, uh, you know, Post your designs around around the internet, Dribble, Reddit, whatever you want to call it, and then um, you know just keep pushing for uh, keep pushing these ideas. Somebody will see it eventually. Uh, from like a student perspective, uh, you know, as you wor start working at whatever company, like you're going to be at Airbnb this summer, working with uh, Airbnb, you know, seeing how, you know, you can, whenever you're s sitting down in like conference rooms with other, um, with other companies, um, s maybe just ha bring up that conversation to somebody from that company while you're there. And, um, you know, like going back to posting your design places, like that's how Microsoft got their new rebrand. Some guy one day was like, I want to redesign Microsoft branding. He did it, posted it on the internet. It got a lot of traction. He got hired by Microsoft and redid their branding. So if you want to design a more accessible car, you want to see a more accessible car, design it, share it, push for it, and hopefully it'll catch fire and you can be the one to do it. Yeah, thank you. And maybe there are opportunities to lift up voices of folks who, you know, need that design, differently designed car. I mean, I think about the role of um, kind of advocacy and protest in um, putting forward the ADA legislation. I mean, it originally was about um, students um, demanding to have access to dormitory housing that did not, you know, was not supportive of their needs as people with disabilities, um, right? And so um, it took a kind of large uh, scale protest in order to, and a lot of work in order to kind of demand that. And I think um, that is primarily the work for folks with disabilities describing what their needs are. But I also think there's a role for allies and um, accomplices to kind of come up alongside that lift up those voices and demonstrate that there's a real need here, right? That especially designers are in a position to address. Yeah, yeah I would say understanding the need. So this, I guess it does, does apply. So on Tuesday night, I was speaking at, uh, at, at, at Sony Pictures. And uh, the moderator of the panel uh, there said, OK, and she runs an autism uh, or, or, uh, arts organization, and she said many people with autism, and probably many people with who participate in her organization, are startled by loud noise, which which is something that's true for some on the autism spectrum. So she she asked everybody in the audience, rather than applaud the way we traditionally do, to applaud the way you do if you're deaf, which is you, you do sort of jazz hands. You, you do jazz hands, and we did that all night. So understanding what the needs are is a way where you can design. So in the case of a car, if you're trying to get those who startle easily, then maybe there's a way to design a car that, that deals with, the, with sudden noises. So that's, that, that's one example. That's my answer. <laughs> well, I want to thank our panelists. We're closing in on the, uh, the end of the hour here. Lisa Junkin Lopez from the Juliet Gordon Lowe Birthplace. Uh, Nolan Kennedy with IBM and Jeffrey Shapiro with Exceptional Mind Studios. And thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of the day.